It is so good to be back in the house of the Lord. We miss some of our key folks that we're used to having here, but like we said, the Lord's with us, and God's with them as they're making their way back home. And we'll look forward, hopefully, to hearing some amazing testimonies tonight. I don't want to steal any thunder, but I was uh, told, I was texted last night pretty late by Colton, and he didn't tell me who, but he said three of the, I guess the young people with them had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost while they were there. So I'm looking forward to hearing a good report today. Amen. <coughs> but it's so good to be in the Lord's house. I want to uh, go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to ask that the Lord would speak to us. Uh, as we continue on our topic of finishing, finishing the Great Commission. And I want to go once again over uh, what we're covering with investing, and then we'll jump ahead tonight if the Lord leads to another topic. Uh, but let's pray right now for God's Spirit to have His way. Holy Ghost, we commit to you the remainder of this service. Lord, everything that we're about to do, we, God, whether it be preaching or an altar service, whatever you desire, Lord, we just uh, submit to your will. We pray, O oh Holy God, that whatever you would say to us, that we'll receive it, Lord, with gladness. And we'll accept what you say and take it and use it, God, in this world. And now anoint me as your messenger, and I pray you use me mightily today. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. Invest, investing in the kingdom. We've got the letters F-I-N-I-S-H. F for find. I for intercede. N, networking. I, investing. S, send. And H, harvest. So I want to look today at investing. I want to quote J.K. Johnston, who wrote a book in 1992 from which I'm taking this quote. Christ met believers where they were. He realized what many Christians today still don't seem to understand. Cultivators have to get out in the field. Do you believe that? Amen. <laughs> a farmer can't sit up in the house and eat his pancakes, drink his coffee, and expect the crops to grow. He's got to do something to bring about a harvest. Amen. According to one count, now this really got a hold of me, the Gospels record 132 contacts that Jesus had with people. All right? Six of those contacts were in the temple. Four of those contacts were in synagogues, which would be similar to a church. And 122 were with people out in the mainstream of life. Isn't that something? That most of God's, most of Christ's interaction on this earth with people took place outside of a religious building. So how much more do you think that in these last days the church must reach out beyond the walls of our buildings? And we've got to share the gospel with lost souls. Amen? If you want to grow a church, you start by moving outside and reaching lost souls and inviting them in so that they can be fed with the rest of the body of Christ. I believe in this generation we've got a unique opportunity to bring about the, the final work of the Great Commission. I believe that's how close we are to the coming of the Lord. And we are part of that generation who are going to usher in the rapture, the second coming of Christ. I'm looking forward to that. But before that takes place, I want to talk a little bit more about the Great Commission, about investing. We go to Matthew chapter 28. I appreciate Chloe helping me back there today. Matthew 28, <coughs> verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Brother Ricky, Jesus said right there, I want you to... Uh, Carry out all things. Remember all things. Do all things that I've asked of you. And I was just thinking, and Richard Jeffers would relate to this, if you were training a mechanic, uh, or maybe you're the one doing the job on the vehicle, and you left out one major part. Let's say that you left off the cable that connects to the positive post on a battery. Entire vehicle is built to perfection. The motor, everything looks great, but you've left off that the post or the, the, the wire that goes to the post, positive post on the battery. What would happen? It would not start, would it? 
You could have the most polished engine. I mean, you raise the hood, you can go to First Friday on Broad Street, show it off to everybody, and they say, oh, what a beautiful car. Well, I had to tow it to get it here, though, because we left off the, what would you call that? I say wire. Cable, thank you. The cable to hook up to the positive post. And because of that one part missing, it, it does not allow you to crank and drive the car. So, Brother Ricky, that tells me that when Jesus was saying, I need you to remember and to teach and to do all things that I've said, he's saying if you want to have the true aspect, the true feeling of the full kingdom of God on this earth, you need to do everything that I've taught you. So that means that we can't leave anything out. Over the last few sermons, we've looked specifically at the importance of the anointing when witnessing to people. Luke 4, verses 18 and 19 said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the, the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I want to look at the part that said, liberating the oppressed. Now, in some scriptures, when you speak about oppressed, it speaks of people who... Now, this is putting it as simply as I can think of, as if they have a spirit that is evil hovering over them, and it continues to influence them in a negative way. That's just a simple way of saying what oppression is. But in this particular scripture, they used a Greek word that only appears one time. Some of you said, oh, here we go with the education. <laughs> We're in school again, children. Uh, the Greek word, T-H-R-A-U-O, throw, throw, I can't hardly say it. It is different from any other time it talks about oppression. What does it mean? It actually refers to those who are broken into pieces. So this particular scripture where Jesus was saying, I have come to set at liberty those who are oppressed, he was not talking about those who were demonically influenced. He was saying, I have come to set at liberty those who are broken, to proclaim, to set at liberty those who are broken into pieces as far as the true meaning of the Greek word there. He's saying, I'm going to rebuild you. What is the theme of New Haven? Loving people, rebuilding lives. Jesus said, I've sent the church. I've come under the anointing. I've sent the church under the anointing to rebuild people who are in pieces. What a beautiful work that is. I know, and I think most of you know, that we live in a broken world. Romans chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, but with eager hope. The creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Have any of you ever felt an earthquake <coughs> or been in an earthquake? You ever watched a movie with an earthquake? <laughs> That's about as close as some of us have gotten. I remember years ago when my family still lived in the apartments at Columbia Square, townhouses, <coughs> that I was sleeping and was awakened by a shaking of the entire complex. This would have been in the early 2000s. And I thought, what in the world had just happened? Because I'd never felt anything like that. Well, I found out on the news the next day an earthquake had come through the Rainbow City, Gadsden area. And it shocked me. It wasn't severe enough to where the roof collapsed, thank the Lord. But some people are in situations that are that drastic. And it can kill people if, if they're in the wrong place. When we look at this scripture here, it talks about the earth groaning. Earthquakes would be an example of that. God did not design the earth to experience earthquakes. He designed it with perfection. But when sin was introduced into this world, that's when things such as earthquakes and famines and pestilences, that's when they took place. Children, y'all going to children's church. That's when they took place. When man, when man and woman sinned, that's when they had to start getting a plow and going out and digging up soil and planting seeds because before then, everything grew naturally. Well, that would have been the life. Have any of you ever had a garden? I know Uncle JB, you've had one. Anybody else ever had a garden? Wouldn't it be nice if all you had to do was sit on the porch and chew a toothpick, read the newspaper, and it would just grow? Wouldn't that be nice? Well, that's the way it was before Adam and Eve sinned. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. That's the way God meant for it to be. But the earth groans because it desires to return to that type of existence. 
The earth wants to live like that, to where it just naturally produces blessings. But because of sin, we live in a world where right now it's not that way. The world is broken, and even nature understands that it needs Jesus to come back and to restore things as they were. What else in this world is broken? There are broken marriages. There are broken dreams. Maybe some of you have had dreams years ago, and you really thought things were going to pan out a certain way, and they did not happen the way you hoped, and you feel like your dreams have been broken. There are broken politics where things were set up by founding fathers to flow a certain direction and, and to be uh, where people got along and had disputes and debates, but yet we were all still one country. Even our politics have become broken. We have a broken society in many ways. And I'm sure I could get an amen from this. We have broken bodies. Many of us feel a little bit broken compared to 20 years ago. Listen to the words of King David. In Psalm 31, verses 9 through 12, David said, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye wastes away with grief. Yes, my soul and my body, for my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. I am a reproach among all my enemies, but especially among my neighbors, and am repulsive to my acquaintances. Sounds like this guy's having a bad day. Amen. Those who see me outside flee from me. I don't know if you've ever had it that bad to where when people see you, they take off running. Amen. I mean, if you work for the government or IRS or something, that might be the case, or a lawyer's office coming to deliver some kind of papers. I am forgotten like a dead man out of mind. I am like a broken vessel. Man, if people are in a bad way when they read this scripture, it might knock them right on off the cliff. Amen. This was a rough time in David's life. And it's hard to believe the, the mighty giant killer faced days just like this. Isn't that amazing? Here's the, uh, the man who had gotten older, was a king, and yet he remembered the days when he took down a giant, not with a sniper's rifle, but with a slingshot and a pebble, and cut his head off with his own sword, with Goliath's own sword. Isn't that something? And yet the day came where David said, man, when people even see me, Neil, they go running the other direction. I'm in anguish. I'm miserable. I'm depressed. Whatever he felt, he was expressing that. David, at that point, was broken. Sometimes we drive on city streets, and I particularly remember a visit to Atlanta, Georgia, uh, to a, an Atlanta Braves game. And I remember coming out of that stadium and driving down streets, and there were a lot of overpasses. The, the interstates and the, I guess, highways, they're real tall. So they keep the traffic way up above the city in a, in a lot of areas. And under those bridges, there were so many people that they'd have buggies or blankets, uh, little pieces of furniture, and they would live in poverty, homeless, under those overpasses. And I looked at them, and, and I was thinking, you know, what an awful situation. To me, those people were broken. Sometimes we sit in classrooms as students, even if it's college or, or younger age, and we look at children who you just know they have problems in the home. Sometimes you see it by the way that they are dressed, or maybe mama doesn't ever take time to fix their hair, and they just show up and look like they just woke, out of, woke up and got out of bed. You look at people, and maybe they struggle through all their years. They can hardly pass tests because they just can't concentrate because there's so much turmoil in their life. And we look at people like that, and we say they are broken. We see husbands who are arrested for things such as domestic abuse, beating on members of the family, and the husband's thrown into jail. And we look at the wife and the children and, and see the results of that awful behavior. And we look at that family and say, that family's broken. But I wonder how many times have we went through an entire day and we worked and did a great job. We drank our morning coffee and we had our lunch with our buddies went home that night and enjoyed a little bit of time with our family and sat in front of the television. Maybe we got on our internet on the phone. And before we went to bed, we stood over the sink and brushed our teeth and looked in the mirror and said, when I think about it, I might be broken. Isn't that something? Maybe we're not living under a bridge. Maybe uh, 
our spouse didn't just leave us and we're in a bad situation. Maybe this, maybe that. But yet we might still be on the inside a little bit broken. And what I want to look at today is that Jesus still has an anointing now through the Holy Ghost in the church to heal those who are broken. To take pieces that look like they'll never fit together again. And God says, but you just wait till I I put my fingers on it. You wait till I get it on my potter's wheel. You wait, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now, Brother Jim. Because he's ministering to people. That's what he wants to do. Wait till I get my hands on you if you'll submit to my will and I will put the pieces together to make you complete again. You know, the world seeks a lot of ways and some of you may have done some of the things or used some of the products I'm about to say. We've tried Botox, anti-aging creams, (laughs) move on, Pastor, plastic surgery, hair coloring, hair growth formula. Can I get an amen, man? Hundreds of weight loss plans, Self-help books and conferences to help us succeed at life. But none of these have the total capacity to make us whole from our brokenness. We cover infectious wounds of sin with the band-aids of distraction. We say, well, if I can just get my mind off of it by taking another vacation. If I can change jobs, things will get better. If I can do this or do that, switch churches, maybe it'll get better. A lot of times, that's just the band-aid of distraction. We get our minds off of eternity. Now, I see this all throughout the world by focusing on temporary things. Oh, I'm not going to think about heaven or hell because I'm too focused on my job or on my career or taking another step up or doing this, doing that. Some of you can't hardly think past just going to the grocery store and picking up some bread and milk. Amen. (laughs) Whatever your thoughts are, sometimes those temporary thoughts distract us from eternity. Some people, in order to soothe their consciousness, they call good evil and evil good. We see that all around us. Some people even choose to fight the very laws of nature in order to no longer feel bad about their choices. America finds itself caught in a civil war of opposing ideas, rioting, illegal leaking of top secret information. A constant attack on religious liberties and a massive push to create lawlessness within our city streets. That's where we are. That doesn't describe every person in America, but it shows you the spirit that's at work. It is a spirit of brokenness and it tries to cause greater division so that we'll never become unified again and accomplish God's perfect will. The enemy, if we can look at the news and watch how the devil works in our nation, How much more do you think the devil targets the local church and looks for ways to create brokenness, to shatter parts that seem solid, to cause foundations that looked rock solid to now become shaky with the vibrations of earthquakes, of turmoil and bitterness and unforgiveness and backbiting. The enemy will try to do the same thing to a church as he would to a nation. But thankfully the church has a tool that Most nations as a whole do not have. The church has a name that is above every other name. The church has a promise that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The church has a name by the name of Jesus Christ. And when that name is pronounced, there's coming a day where every knee shall bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you believe that today? We've got the power that the devil will never hold of, and it's called the power of the Holy Ghost. When the power of the Holy Ghost moves within the church, it's greater than any weapon that Satan could bring against a church or a nation. That power of the Holy Ghost supersedes the authority that Satan thinks he has over your family and over your country. The power of the Holy Ghost enables the church to become bold when we proclaim that Jesus is the only way to the Father. And the Spirit of God will manifest His power when you declare truth such as I just spoke. We have the winning weapons of warfare. A lot of people are broken. America seems broken. What can we do about it? Psalm 51 verse 7. Ironically, the only way a person can change going from broken to healed and whole 
is to admit that he or she is broken. Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. The kind of brokenness God's looking for is the, where you say, God, in my own power, I am unable to accomplish what you've put before me. In my power alone, I can't do what you've asked. But only with you can I complete my mission on this planet. That is the type of brokenness God wants you to bring. If you're broken in other ways, he absolutely wants you to bring that to him so he can make you whole. But in this scripture, he's saying, I need a brokenness that says I cannot do it without Jesus. I cannot do it alone. That sounds like a good song. I said, probably somebody sang something like that when I was a child because it seems like it's ringing a bell. But I can't do it alone. Amen. I have to have Jesus. Luke 4, 18, second part said, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. What does that mean? It means to release from bondage and to forgive sins. Now, you probably didn't know this. It also means to forgive sins as if they had never happened before. Now, that's enough to shout about, Rachel. I can't help but get excited when I hear God's willing to forgive me to a place where I, it's as if I never blew it. I never messed up. Can you imagine going into the throne room of a king with all the guilt that some of us have and saying, I know I'm not even worthy to serve in your kingdom, and, 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 but I trust you're willing to forgive me. And the king looks at you and said, hey, I just wiped your slate clean. Go on out and make me proud. Can you imagine that? And yet, how much greater does God treat us when we walk in filthy with sin, we walk in with failure, we walk in with doubts. Lord, you know the way my mind was this past Thursday. It's different than it is right now in New Haven on Sunday. But Thursday, maybe I was thinking a different way. And God, you're even willing to say that you'll take me from that Thursday thinking and you'll wipe it clean and make me new today. Isn't that something? Amen. That's the way Jesus is. <laughs> I just had a thought, Sister Deborah. If the world actually knew the type word that was being spoken in, in godly churches like what you just heard, I bet these places would be filled up. But the world's not going to know what's being spoken until we act as an echo and we repeat what is spoken from whoever's teaching or preaching and go out and tell the world that God's willing to get you to a point where it's as if you've never sinned your whole life. Every fault, everything you did is about to be wiped clean if you'll just go through the name of Jesus, accept him as Savior, and let his blood wash you clean. Can you imagine how many people would come flocking into buildings like this if we would echo that word and let the world know there is hope for your family. Ooh, glory. There's hope for your financial situation. There's hope for your children. There's hope. And it's through Jesus Christ. And I'm glad we serve a God of hope. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, he is able to take broken people. And through the use of his nail-scarred hands, which is a reminder, a testimony of what he went through for you, he's still able to lift up the broken and to make them whole. What a God we serve. Number six, because number five was um, let's see, liberating the oppressed. Number six, proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord in this series. I want to look at proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord. When I have been reading in Luke over and over for years about the anointing, breaks the yoke, the, uh, sets the captives free, I almost always ignore or, or don't take note at all about the last part of that scripture proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord. To me, it's just like, oh, well, <laughs> that's good. And then I decided, Corey, to study what it meant in this series, and I found out something spectacular. Now, stay with me. The acceptable year of the Lord refers literally to the year of Jubilee. Now, I know we don't get into as far as about Jubilee. We're, every year for me is Jubilee. But, but I want to make a point. This was the year in which all debts were canceled, slaves were released, and possessions were returned to their rightful owners. Here's what Jesus was saying. Through the anointing of the Holy Ghost, he was telling us this is the perpetual year, an acceptable year of the Lord. He's saying, from now on, after my sacrifice, after I rise from the dead, every year is a oh glory. Every year is a year where the captives are going to go free. And through Christ, every year. 
is a year when possessions that the devil stole from you are going to be returned. You don't have to wait 50 years, Brother Jim, to get to another year of Jubilee. He's saying this is the acceptable year of the Lord. Why is that? Because when Jesus came, he was not held just to the rigid standard of having to wait 50 years like the Jews were. He said, I'm come. I'm coming with the acceptable year of the Lord every year. Every year, all the time, every week, every day, every hour is now the moment of being set free. All I've got to have is somebody willing to accept my word. All I need, according to God, he would say, all I need is somebody who's willing to step into that anointed river and to get their feet wet and to say, dear God, whatever you would say unto me, I receive. I'm not going to wait until 50 years from now so mom and daddy can finally get free. We're going to get free this week because the word of God says now that where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty I don't have to wait 50 years anymore for the spirit to be liberty the spirit today is liberty oh hallelujah that ought to get somebody excited when the anointing is flowing let me tell you some of the stuff that happens children who are prodigals begin to return home oh glory good health returns to many of us when that anointing is flowing Spiritual debts are canceled. That means the devil can't hold anything else over your head because God says paid in full. Oh, hallelujah. When the anointing's flowing, sometimes you'll see bills get paid that you don't know how in the world they got paid. I remember times where I, with my business, and I owed people about $900 at one point, and there was a company, and I thought, well, um, uh, they haven't sent me a bill yet. And I knew I'd order the materials, Ricky. You know how that is. And you wait on them to send you a bill, and hope, hopefully they don't send it. <laughs> but if they don't, you're, you're not upset. But I remember calling the company because I owed them about $900. This had been three or four months. And I said, I, I just want to let you know that uh, I owe you about $900, and I don't know why I haven't received an invoice. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you sent it to the wrong place or not. Some of you would say, man, you're crazy. But I felt like I was supposed to do this. Well, I'm going to tell you why I felt it, because of what God did. I called them, and they said, Sir, we have looked up your account. You are clear with us. We have no record that you owe us one penny. I said, Well, at least I made things right by calling you. Praise God. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> hallelujah. Well, hallelujah. That was $900. Praise the Lord. When the anointing's flowing, sometimes God will do supernatural things like that. Sometimes it's just to test you. Just to see if you'll call and say, hey, I owe you this. What do you show? And then God will back up that miracle even more. That's just like when God does a healing work. Some people, they feel different when God touches them in the altar. And let's say that they had cancer. In the, say it's in the bones. And they feel totally released from that. There's no more pain, no more issues. But some people are so afraid to go to the doctor after they get that feeling because they're afraid the doctor's going to tell them they still have cancer and then they're going to say, oh man, I was just imagining something. But here's my view. Just like calling that distributor that I owed money just to back up what I, I was hoping God was doing as far as blessing me, I believe we are to call the doctor and call the nurses and say, hey, I want you to confirm what God just did in the altars. Amen? Don't be afraid to let God use the world to confirm his work. Amen? God will do it through science, medical field. If God really does a miracle for you, then the, the science will back up what God has done. You don't have to be afraid of that. When the anointing's flowing, chains of addiction are broken. Oh, I'm telling you, I like that right there. Now, I'm not saying when the anointing's flowing, every bit of this is going to happen, but I'm telling you, when it is flowing, these things are possible. Any of this can happen. When the anointing's flowing, Richard, some of our friends begin to get saved. Because they feel that drawing. I can't say all will get saved because that's free will. They make that choice. But when the anointing's flowing through you, you make things possible that were impossible without the anointing. Oh, praise God for his word. Let me give you some good news, and then we're going to come to a close. It's a little early. I might, might need to add a few things. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Theblaze.com reported on January 12th, 2017 that thousands upon thousands of Muslims are converting to Christianity in the Middle East. That was January of this year. Isn't that wonderful? The Voice of the Martyrs Canada stated, Despite the mass exodus of many Christians, the church is far from empty in Syria, Iraq, Jordan, and other parts of the Middle East. God has been very faithful. There are strong Christian believers remaining in these areas, and tremendous growth is taking place in the life of new believers who were Muslims. Praise God. The presence of the church is vitally important. People are desperate and seeing very little hope, but the fact that there is still 
that there still is a church gives them encouragement and hope. Another report from the Christian Post reported that 91,000 Muslims in Bangladesh have converted to Christianity in the last six years. The Christian population there is now 1.6 million, which is about 1% of the population. That's not a big percent, but that's a lot of Christians. Then I want to share this prophetic word. Boy, this stirred my soul. February 17, 2017, that's about a month ago, the Lord gave this uh, revelation, this prophecy, to prophetic author and speaker Cindy Jacobs. If you want to research her, the Lord actually used her a year ago to prophesy of Donald Trump being elected president, and she told some very specific things about the entire process and election. It just blew me away when I read it. This is what the Lord gave to her for this year. For the Lord would say, we are entering into a new season, and do not let the tumult of the season deter you from the path I have called you, the Lord says. Don't let fear get in your heart, for I am truly releasing a reformation into the United States of America, says the Lord. The Lord says, I truly am releasing an awakening. What you see on the news is simply Satan very discouraged and very angry because of the things that he knows he's going to have to let go of. Oh, man, I like that right there. But know this. Now, here's some, you want to talk about word of wisdom in Sunday school this morning. Here's a word of wisdom. I know God spoke this. Because this was before all the rioting. A lot of it took place after the election. This was, well, no, it would have been uh, right after. Listen to this. Check your heart, for it is not a place to be triumphal or to get into triumphalism by saying we are this or we are that. Now, he's saying don't become haughty because of maybe the way things are, it, it, politics, if they're going the way you hope they would, don't become haughty. Now, this right here, you want to talk about word of wisdom, listen. The Lord says do not add fuel to the pain of people. The Lord says, I will cause you to be a bridge builder, not a bridge destroyer. Now, the reason I know without a doubt this is from the Lord is because sometimes Christians get into a frame of mind when things go our way, such as if there were to be a reversal of gay marriage, if there were to be finally an overturning of Roe versus Wade, which we're hoping for, where that little innocent babies will, not, will no longer legally be killed, it could cause us to become haughty and say, yeah, told y'all. Uh-huh. See what can happen now? We're in the right. Well, we are in the right by standing for life. But at the same time, the Lord is telling us, don't become haughty even when, when you win. Amen? Listen to this. The Lord says it's time to check our hearts as Americans. Do not let the political spirit come in and begin to cause you to be one that brings division rather than unity. This is time to throw water rather than gasoline on the fires. Amen. Come on. This is the time to come in the opposite spirit. And that's all that I had to read from her, from that prophecy. It got a hold of me, Brother Randall. Because I thought, e even me, sometimes I want to get on Facebook and be like, la, 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 you know, something goes the way I think it should, and I'm going to tell off those liberals. I feel that way. But the Lord's saying, that's not my way. I mean, if that were Jesus' way, he would have come in and everybody who was living wrong, living in sin, doing wrong, hit a dog to all of them. Jesus would have come and said, you old sorry dogs. Talking to the uh, adulterers and the drunkards and the, the people who uh, cheated and lied. He said, you all a bunch of sorry folks. But you know what he did? He came with love. He came with kindness. He showed them how to turn from their wicked ways by having their minds and hearts transformed. He showed them in the right spirit in such a way as they wanted to follow them. Jesus did not have to hand out hot dogs and chips. And I'm not against that, Brother Gary. I'm not against it. But Jesus didn't have to hand out hot dogs every time just to get somebody to show up to a Bible study. Were there times he ministered? There was times he blessed them with fish and bread, of course. But every single time Jesus had a meeting, we don't see him handing out popcorn and chips or, or snicker bars and Dr. Peppers, do we? That, it wasn't a requirement for Jesus to be effective. Jesus reached deeper than the mouth and the stomach. He reached into the hearts. And he showed people, if you'll let me, I can change your life. If you'll trust me, I can lead you into eternal life where you'll never have to experience death. 
at least in the form of going down to a place of being held against your will in a, uh, Abraham's bosom. You won't experience that kind of death. You'll instantly be with me and my Father in heaven whenever you pass. That's the kind of influence and impact Jesus Christ had. And that's what I hear in these words of this prophetess, that God is saying to us, don't add gasoline to the fire, add water, and put out some of these horrific things that are taking place. It'd be easy to have somebody that held up a poster saying that it's a woman's right to kill a baby, and I'd want to get up in their face and say, you, you, you sorry thing, stand in for murder. It'd be easy to say that in the wrong attitude if I got in the flesh. But the greatest thing is to vote people in who are going to stand for life, to influence those who represent us in Washington to try to help protect the lives of the unborn and to uh, put people in positions such as a president who will influence the Supreme Court of the United States that will hopefully swing toward life. And then, of course, praying for those who stand on the opposite side of the fence and whenever we can, influence them by being kind to them and loving them and treating people right. Amen. Say, preacher, that's a whole lot easier when you're standing behind a pulpit to talk like that. Well, if it was easy, then every one of us would be perfect, probably. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of the things that are spoken, it's a hard thing. And we need God's help in order to do it. Colossians 3.15. Chloe, throw that scripture up there for me. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. I, I like to think that our people in the church are educated and literate. So I'm going to ask you to read that with me. Boy, that was a setup for asking you to read, wasn't it? <coughs> Here we go. Colossians 3.15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Trisha, you ever try to get your kids just to be thankful? Isn't that a struggle sometimes? Well, I want to watch this show. I want to watch that show. Oh, where y'all want to eat tonight? Let's, let's just go to McDonald's. Let's go to Burger King. Now, I want Taco Bell. And I try to tell my kids, be thankful you have anything. Amen. Amen. I certainly try to instill that in their minds. Way before Michael Knight had Roxy Jane and Chloe and Molly, <clears throat> Paul was dealing with the church of, of the Colossians. And he was telling them, guys, ladies, just be thankful. Be thankful you have another day to serve the king. Be thankful you're saved on your way to glory. Be thankful you serve a Jesus who is greater than every temptation you'd ever face. Amen. But he said, I want you to be peace speakers. I want to leave you today with this thought. Always remember you exist in the perpetual year of the Lord. This is the acceptable year. 2018 will be the acceptable year. 2019 will be the acceptable year of the Lord. Because every year is a year of anointing. I'm expecting, bro, to hear of more conversions this year than last year at New Haven in America and in the world. I'm expecting to hear of more Holy Ghost baptisms than we saw last year. And every year I'm going to expect more because we're in the perpetual acceptable year of the Lord. And I'm also expecting to see revivals breaking out all over our country. Amen. As God's people pray, he said he would heal our land. Amen. Stand with me today God's so good <clears throat> let's pray Heavenly Father there are perhaps very serious needs in this congregation of people Lord and you know their hearts you know their lives you know what they would ask of you Lord if they were to be handed this mic right now and they could say God I really need this but Lord because you hear our hearts they don't have to do that all they've got to do is ask you where they are. So I pray right now that, Lord Jesus, whatever needs are in this congregation, that right now as Jesse is playing, Lord, under your anointing, that people will begin praying directly to you and saying, God, here's what I need. Now what do you need from me? Here's what I need. Now what do you need from me? What do you want me to do? What must I do to obey you? Church, would you just pray where you are right now? And I'm going to pray with you. Heavenly Father. My God, I want to know your perfect will. I ask, Lord, you direct me, my steps. Help me, oh Lord, to follow you. God, that everything I do would be pleasing to you. Lord, you know the things that I would like to have, things I need, things that I want, God. Lord, I thank you that 
Lord, every debt's going to be paid. I thank you, Lord, that every sick body, Lord, connected with my family, we're, we're going to be healed. I thank you, O oh God, that this ministry, Lord Jesus, is going to be blessed, it's going to thrive, and that we'll see thousands saved, Lord, through this ministry. Thank you, Lord God Almighty, Lord, that you're going to just bless and move. Oh, Lord God, give us increase for our labor. Give us that harvest, Lord, that we prayed for. Lord, touch our sick, our families in the church, God. Those who are dealing with emergencies and problems, financial problems, Lord, I pray that you'd meet their needs. Thank you, O oh Holy Ghost of God, that you are walking with us. That, Lord, you have filled us, you've baptized us, you're empowered us. God, give us a word for the lost, I pray, even this week. What would you have us do, Lord? I pray you'd show us. And we'll follow you. Oh, glory to God, I give you thanks. Before we conclude today, I want to ask, is there anyone who wants special prayer? We always love to pray with you if you've got a specific need. Because I know I've seen over and over God moves fast. He works miracles. Amen. If you've got a need in this congregation, would you come on up and let me know and we'll pray with you. We've got time to pray. Always got time to pray. Amen. Is there anything, any need? Yes. Any others? Anyone else want prayer today for anything at all? He's an on-time God. Yes, He is. All we got to do is dial up that name, Jesus. We can reach the Father. Mm -hmm. All right, those who will help me, let's come around, Brother Jim. We're going to pray today. I'm just going to ask him what he needs, and then we're going to pray, and then we'll be dismissed unless anyone else needs prayer.